Hello and welcome to Tech Latest by Nikkei Asia, where we bring you the freshest updates from the technology sector in Asia. Every episode, one of our reporters from the region will be filling us in on the tech news on their radar, from semiconductors in China to space travel in Japan to startups in Indonesia. From Nikkei Asia's Tokyo headquarters, I'm Alice French. In this episode, I'm catching up with Sean Turton, our Australia correspondent, about recent efforts by Southeast Asian and Australian leaders to get the region's cyber slavery problem under control. Hi, Sean. Thank you so much for joining us for your Tech Latest debut. Thanks for having me, Alice. It's uh, good to be on my first podcast. So before you were posted to Sydney, you did a lot of reporting for us in Southeast Asia. And one of the topics that you focused on was the dark underworld of online scamming and cyber slavery. Now, for listeners that might not be aware of how huge of an issue it is in the region, can you just start by giving us a rundown of the problem? Why is scamming so prolific over there and what kinds of people are involved? So a bit of background on my own reporting past. I've sort of spent several years in Southeast Asia and uh, mostly mostly in Cambodia. Sort of first arrived there in uh, 2015. And um, I mean, this type of activity, I suppose, has been, been present, you know, for a long time. It's something that I think has really picked up in the last couple of years, and that's for a number of reasons. I mean, first of all, they uh, like to, you know, have jurisdictions or places where, you know, rule of law is quite weak and corruption quite prevalent because it gives them space to operate. And um, it's a really labor heavy sort of industry. They need lots of people scamming, you know, even more people to to make, you know, the sort of uh, millions and billions of dollars that this industry uh, captures. During COVID, uh, you know, when it became much harder to move people around countries, the scam industry in places like Cambodia and Myanmar sort of changed a little bit from maybe being a little bit more below the radar, uh, being able to bring people in. You know, they could sort of leave if they if they wanted to and turn much towards more traditional types of human trafficking uh, you know, luring people under false pretenses, keeping them, you know, more or less in, in, in captivity. So, yeah, I guess over um, over COVID, this problem really began to become quite substantial. And, um, you yeah, know, we, we did a story in, in 2021 looking at uh, some of these, you know, some of the, the victims that had managed to escape these compounds. And, and uh, yeah, we've sort of been following it since then. One thing that I suppose, even from an even broader level, is that like cyber scams, I think reflect this like confluence of sort of different phenomena, right? Like you have sort of era now where it's it's much more acceptable to, to meet people online and to like form relationships and and stuff online, and then you also have this like global communications technology in in everybody's pocket. The technology is there now to reach you know thousands of people at once. Uh, and then, you know, you combine that with the situation in places like Cambodia, where there is essentially free reign for people who can afford to pay the authorities, then you, it's sort of a trifecta, right? You have, you have a business model, you have a, a location, and, you know, you have, uh, they have people to target. Another aspect that started to, to become more prominent over the last sort of five, 10 years is the ability to move, you know, money around outside of traditional finance these scam scammers are almost entirely using cryptocurrencies to you know move money around the other thing as well is that you know these compounds are sometimes set up in you know what they call so special economic zones or industrial parks uh so they really inhabit in some places sort of infrastructure that ostensibly was to promote manufacturing and and services and so this and so they use these spaces uh, for, for criminal activities instead. For the sort of political elite in places like Cambodia or, or Myanmar or Thailand, like they just generate a whole lot more money than, than a factory would, you know, or a, or agricultural operation. Like, you know, those things are huge investments that take, you know, sometimes years to, to, to pay off. Whereas if you start up a scam compound, you know, you can pay millions of dollars in, in sort of bribes and, uh, suitcases within within days probably 
you know, it's sort of they run like kind of joint ventures, right? Like you'll have a um, a patron that provides the land and the security, and uh, then you know a business in quotes that you know that pays for that. But the difference is in this case, the business is is is, is a criminal business. It's, it's it, it all makes sense if you just look at it from an economic perspective. In some of these countries, it's a vital source of income for the political elite. Um, and you know Cambodia, which I know well, has um, at times conducted raids or you know made statements that acknowledge the problem. But most of those those efforts are usually in response to news reports or you know uh, statements by by the US or or, um, or other countries. So it, it's it's largely performative in nature because at the end of the day, you know this this is vital to, to the political economy of these countries. Okay, and as you say, the pandemic really accelerated this problem of cyber scans across the region, but they've actually been back in the headlines again this past week in your neck of the woods, as Australia and ASEAN leaders pledged to cooperate on curbing these scams, right? What exactly did they agree on? What sort of wording did they use? There really wasn't much discussion, even on, on transnational national crime at, at this uh, at this summit in Melbourne. There was a mention in the declaration that they put out yeah, this week about boosting cooperation to to combat transnational crime, specifically human trafficking. So there wasn't really any any specific mention of you know the scam phenomenon uh, directly. It was um, really only sort of uh, one or two people that I spoke to there that, that sort of uh, have been being concerned about this that, that raised the issue. So, I mean, it's it's quite a small and, and you know, um, vague uh, reference to, to sort of the umbrella of transnational crime. So it's a bit hard to say what that might mean. But, um, I mean, it's certainly, it's certainly come more on the, on the radar in, in recent years. And one of the things that has helped get this issue a bit of traction is that uh, several embassies in Southeast Asia uh, have... Um, you know, issued alerts for their citizens traveling places like Cambodia and Myanmar, which are sort of the real hotspots when it comes to, uh, you know, online cyber scam uh, sort of businesses and, and compounds. Uh, you know, they, they've issued uh, travel warnings because they've had, you know, hundreds, thousands of, of their of their nationals you know, trafficked in these places and, and trapped. So it definitely is an issue with within the uh, the, the Asian bloc, but. Um, you know, as is the way with uh, Asian diplomacy, they're usually pretty uh, re reluctant to call out, you know, member states publicly on this sort of stuff. So yeah, it, it was it did get a mention in the final declaration, but it really wasn't a an issue that that was spoken about publicly at the, the conference, which is you know disappointing when you have Cambodian leader uh, at the at the event. Um, yeah, it would have been would have been good to. Uh, to have it have it raised because I mean at the end of the day and I think this is something that's getting more and more attention is these these scammers I mean you know there's obviously one level of misery and suffering which is people that are trafficked into this uh, into this sort of illegal industry but the the industry targets people around the world so that's you know, that's victims in Australia that's victims in in the US in Europe or all, all, all around and the UN estimates that you know th th these operations generate sort of billions of of dollars. Yeah, it's a huge national security problem for each country, um, and um, and yeah, it would have been nice to to sort of see see more discussion about it at the the summit. Right. So, like you mentioned, um, Australia was hosting leaders of several ASEAN countries last week, and this was just one line in what's called the Melbourne Declaration, which is the document that they put out after their summit. Now, what are experts saying about this pledge? Are they seeing it? Uh, optimistically, does it seem to be a step in the right direction, or is there quite a lot of sort of scepticism around how effective this will actually be for the victims involved? Well, uh, I mean, in terms of the take on the pledge, I mean, I haven't really heard too much about directly what that might mean. But I mean, speaking about the issue sort of more broadly, uh, one of the only real people to bring it up at the summit was uh, uh, Pichamon Yapantong. She's a uh, member of the uh, UN uh, Working Group on, on Business and Human Rights and uh, a sort of security expert with Deakin University. And uh, I mean, she brought it up in the context of just, you know, broader discussions about security in, in the region that you know, focus on maybe sort of states um, 
you know, state on state tension. Uh, so she wanted to direct uh, the attention towards um, threats by non state actors. So in this case, uh, transnational crime groups uh, doing cyber scams. And um, she mentioned it's something that places like Australia should really be more concerned about because, you know, crime, organized crime in Southeast Asia is spilling out into the region, into Australia. So, yeah, you know, experts, expert, experts like that are sort of uh, hoping for, for more collective action on, on things like this, because these groups, they're not bound by any countries, by any borders. They, they play sort of cat and mouse games uh, with authorities all over the world looking for jurisdictions with weak law enforcement and uh, corruption where they can set up and, and have free reign. So, yeah, it's really going to take a sort of, um, you know, a multilateral effort to, to to sort of um, to make progress on stopping this issue. It becomes difficult because, you know, when you're dealing with places like, you know, Cambodia and Myanmar, I mean, Myanmar in, in particular has its own internal sort of security problems with ongoing sort of civil war that have made uh, the rule of law in, even more difficult. But um, there's definitely, I think, a, a bigger role for places like Australia to be more vocal about um, about these issues. So. So yeah, there's again not not so much information about what this declaration is going to mean or what's going to translate to, but I mean the fact that it's on there is 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 better than not. Uh, there wasn't guaranteed that it was going to uh, perhaps be on there because it really wasn't discussed openly at the the forum. So yeah, I guess we'll have to wait and see what uh, it translates to. Yeah, so as you say, it sounds like the cyber scam crisis in Southeast Asia is very much far from over. And I'm sure it will be something that we'll continue to cover at Nikkei Asia. And I'm sure that your coverage will also be very informative on that topic. Well, thanks so much, Sean, for coming on. Thank you for debuting on Tech Latest today. And we hope to hear more from you from Down Under in the future. Thanks very much for having me, Alice. That's all for this episode. You can read more of Sean's reporting, along with a host of other stories about Asia's tech industry, on Nikkei Asia's website, asia.nikkei.com. And if you like what you hear, why not subscribe to our weekly Tech Asia newsletter, which will be delivered to your inbox every Thursday. There's a link to sign up in the show notes. And whilst we've still got you, if you're enjoying Tech Latest and would like to support us, please do give us a follow on whichever podcast platform you use. We also really appreciate any reviews you can leave, as these help new listeners to find our episodes. Our next instalment will be out on Tuesday, March the 18th. Check back in then for more updates on the tech trends that matter.